So when we look at the emergence of global Christianity and this movement we're calling the, the, the majority world church, there are a number of broad themes which are in fact emerging, which are really important for us to recognize. Now this, this is not a universal statement about true all over the world. This is broadly true all over the world, okay? So we're looking at some basic trends. First of all, uh, broadly speaking, the majority world church has uh, shown a commitment to the inspiration and authority of Scripture. So these are not so-called progressive movements. Uh, these are movements that are very, very conservative in terms of their faith and their confidence in the Word of God. That's very important. This means that even though we're losing dramatic Christians in the Western world and they're, we're gaining them in the, in the uh, uh, majority world church, the kind of Christian that is coming up are actually Christians that are more likely to affirm the authority of Scripture. That has huge benefit for the future of the church. Secondly, they tend to be morally and ethically conservative. So therefore, they tend to think about the, the gospel in terms of how it affects issues of morality and ethics in ways that affirm uh, conservative uh, thought on a number of issues. It would include things like homosexual marriage or gender reassignment. The global church generally would be conservative on things like that that have been very much part of how the Western church has been co-opted. A third thing would be these churches are much more sensitive to issues around poverty and social justice. Uh, in the Western world, there tended to be a dichotomy between the two, and you had churches that were involved uh, in the evangelistic kind of ministries but were not sensitive to issues of poverty and justice. And this becomes something that's extremely important to the majority world church. They arise out of context where oftentimes there are issues of massive disparity. Uh, you have challenges with poverty, challenges with discrimination. They are often minorities in their country, and therefore they're much more aware of social justice issues. Fourthly, the global church has been much more adept at articulating the uniqueness of Christ in the midst of religious pluralism. The Western world, of course, had for so, for centuries, had been sojourning without any kind of conversation partners, whether Hinduism, Buddhism, Muslims, or otherwise, we really weren't prepared for the rise of religious pluralism in the Western world. So for example, my grandmother probably would never have met a Buddhist in her entire life. Um, now it would be impossible probably to grow up in a, in a especially an inner city school and not have your schoolmates who would, may perhaps come from backgrounds in Islam or Hinduism or whatever. So these are really important differences. And the global church, the, uh, I worked in India, the Christians I work with for, you know, in all their memory, they'd never known a Christian faith that was not, did not have to be dialogue with the surrounding Hindu context, et cetera. So that's a very, very big difference. Then finally, broadly speaking, the majority world church comes from cultures that are less individualistic and therefore they're much more able to understand the corporate aspects of the gospel. And that's extremely uh, important in the way that uh, theology is developed. Because in the Western world, as we'll see as this course develops, so much of theology was developed along individualistic lines. And the global church has had a pretty powerful critique of that in ways that have helped us to expand our understanding uh, of Scripture. So this whole process and how the church expands and thinks differently is a process that I'm calling theological translatability. And what that means is it's the ability of the, the gospel essentials, the, the kerygma, the core of the gospel, to be rediscovered and restated within potentially an infinite number of new global context. So this whole book, this whole course is really about how we think about theology and how we understand that in these new global contexts. And I believe as the, as the gospel spreads and encounters new cultures, they are able to take the gospel, translate it, think about it in ways that are very, very powerful. Now, there are a number of themes that come through this that are very, very powerful. It helps us uh, to really, as Christians in the West, to be better informed about what's happening in this emerging, growing Christian movement. It's important that if you, for example, secondly, if you live within a particular tradition, let's say you come from a dispensationalist tradition or you come from a Reformed tradition or a Wesleyan tradition, there's a tendency to think that this particular tradition uh, has got it all right. You know, we've, we have it all figured out and this particular tradition is 
the best. But what happens is you begin to sojourn with Christians that have no background in Reformed theology per se, or in Wesleyan theology per se, or dispensationalism per se, or any other system like that. You'll see they actually come at things in a way that creates new insights, and you realize that every theological system is, generally speaking, uh, addressing problems with previous systems or addressing lacks, is bringing out certain emphases. And really, only by listening to all of these groups can we properly understand ways in which the church can be better informed and be hopefully more mature as we, as we go through.